I'm down a headcount. I'm down a resource. I got to go sell more tires or I got to do more with less. And this group is coming in here with more requests that I'm supposed to do. No way. Um, and so we approached it from a balanced perspective, right? We tried to simplify it. We tried to get everybody's ideas. We did implement some education, uh, but we we created these two resources that essentially sat alongside or sit alongside our HR partners, um, and they work with the business to say, what is it that you need? You are saying that you have hiring challenges. How can DEI be a benefit for you? Ebony, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. So let's dive in here. Of course, it's been a pleasure having the opportunity to work with you for these last few years. Career Thrivers, and we were just talking right before <laughs> we started. It's been since 2019, Crazy. so it's been several years. And it's been really inspiring to see, I think, when the community professionals think about organizations that are leading within diversity, equity, and inclusion, our minds automatically go to tech companies mm -hmm. we always think about the industry and lane that Bridgestone America is, is in, but we see it from a different perspective and you all are certainly leading the charge in this work. There's been a lot of organizational trans, uh, transformation mm -hmm. over the last few years and you've been leading that work and it's been great being a strategic partner with you. Talk to us a little bit about just your own development journey as a leader and how it's evolved over these last four years. Yeah. so. So we are trying to be a tech company as well, <laughs> just to put that out there. So we are moving into a solutions orientation for our business. Um, and I think that is what really started the whole focus on DEI, because if you're going to compete with the Microsofts, the Amazons, or have them as partners, you've got to have the workforce that looks like them, right? Um, you've got to connect with a customer, which is not your typical tire customer, which is mm -hmm. a white male. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had to do this. This wasn't a nice to have. We had to. And I was humbled to lead the effort. Um, my hairstylist actually calls me humble bougie. And I don't think that I am. <laughs> uh, but what that means is that I don't like the spotlight, right? So when we started working together, you were pushing me. You're like, you got to get in front of it. You got to talk to people. And I'm like, Brittany, I can't be as confident as you. I, I don't do this. Like I am the HR profession by uh, trade. And I am the one that's like a good HR person is heard, not seen, right? You hear my coaching when you hear my leaders talk. You hear my voice when they talk about inclusion or they talk about connecting to the teammate. We call our employees teammate. Um, and so this was a front and center, get out, talk to people. People don't know how to do this and they're asking me the tough question and I don't have a choice but to be in the spotlight. Um, so I'd say over the four years, I've gotten more confident in my voice. Mm -hmm. um, it was always heard, but it wasn't always seen. And so I've learned how to be humble, bougie, uh, to, to have that humility when I speak, but have standards and not be afraid to communicate those standards and hold people accountable to that. So, you know, you've you encouraged me along the way. Lots of coaching, lots of positive feedback. Um, and I am stepping into the light. Well, you know, that makes me so excited. <laughs> Next to owning your career, like owning your voice is one of my mantras. And it's so important <laughs> mm -hmm. like for any leader at any level, when you look at how leaders advance within corporate organizations, performance is 10% of the pie. Yeah. The other, the I and the E of the pie is image and exposure. Mm -hmm. So you have to be out there. You have to be owning that narrative. And for you, particularly in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it becomes even more important because people often have their own opinion about why the organization is taking on the mantle. So I think maybe just to set the record straight or to inform those who might be new to this side of Bridgestone's business, you all didn't start DEI work when Career Thrivers started working with you in 2019 or in 2020, <laughs> as many organizations did. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's the case for anyone that's listening in, but you all had started that work, but you really dug in deeper. And we got to sit down together with your executive level leaders, mm -hmm. which I think 
is important to make mention of because it is a difference maker mm -hmm. when you're talking about setting a DEI strategy. And you really said, hey, what does this need to look like? Talk to us a little bit about some of those initial conversations from your seat, advising and recommending your ex-co, your executive mm -hmm. level leaders on what the organization needs to be doing to move in, move in the right direction. Yeah, so I think we talked about this. It was acknowledging what had been done before, right? Mm -hmm. So in 2020, world flipped upside down, the murder of George Floyd, all the companies started committing. But for us, we had been doing this since 2016. We had our first uh, women's uh, employee resource group, mm -hmm. um, and that is B1, and it was amazing. And it was a grassroots effort, and that started leadership to start really thinking about what does the women representation need to look like. Mm -hmm. And then we had our Bravo, which was our veterans, and then we also had uh, Be Bold, which was our African-American one. So we had these employee or teammate-led initiatives. We had a headcount dedicated to it and we tied it to talent and we tied it to engagement. And so we needed to be respectful of what was already in place because the last thing you want to do is come in and say, mm, what you've been doing is wrong, right? right? So that that wasn't it. It was, let me build upon that. And so the way we approached it was with respect mm -hmm. and acknowledgement of the efforts that had been done and saying, we're going to build on that, right? So we had these three focus areas, marketplace, mm -hmm. workplace, and workforce, which is a fancy way of saying our culture, and then our people, and then what's happening outside of the walls of Bridgestone. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have targets, we didn't have vision, we didn't know where we wanted to go with it. We just knew that if we were going to move DEI forward, you had to focus in those three areas. Mm -hmm. And so we talked to the leadership team to say, first, what is it that you want from this? Starting very clearly with what is the expectation? And they told us so many things. And I remember you and I were in a back room and we're like, okay, this is a lot. Like, what do we need to do? And so what quickly came to mind was we need to start with our beliefs because you've got all these great leaders with great opinions that have been pseudo doing the work and need to accelerate it, but don't exactly know how to do it. So they're drawing from their own personal experiences. And so we needed to say, what is it within Bridgestone that we believe, or what is it that we believe uh, we need to move forward. So we created a beliefs. And that was something to try to quiet the differences that people had mm -hmm. to say, listen, we may not agree on everything, but these five things we agree on. That is the why or the what really matters about DEI. And from there, we then said, what's the mission? We folded in those three focus areas. And then we said our employee resource groups drive our culture. So let's elevate them. Let's give them more support. Let's make sure they have a bigger budget. Let's make sure they have professional development. Let's make sure they are the change advocates for the culture. And we're gonna stand alongside them, behind them and in front of them when we need to, to protect them. Um, and then we said for our people, we're gonna set some measurable goals. And so those goals, and I remember you and I having this conversation, you're like, be aggressive. And I'm like, maybe not too aggressive. Uh, but what you were saying was go further so that we can reach something, right? So we could reach in the middle. So for us, we decided that we weren't gonna have a number, but we were going to say we want a leadership team that looks like the population and we want a population that looks like the world. So those numbers are always moving. They're never going to be a hard target. I think from our annual report, we had um, about 26% in terms of uh, women representation. And so we need our leadership team to be around that so that, that they can advocate, so that they can understand their biases, so that they can reach back and pull others up. Um, and so that's what we did. We essentially, if, approach the EXCO with data. EXCO is our senior leadership. We approached them with data. We grounded them in the beliefs and the facts. We pushed farther knowing that we're not gonna get there, but we've gotta have something to aspire to. And we did it with the what really matters in mind. Yeah, and just to add some color for anyone that's listening in, you know, you talked about settling in on what you believe. And that was really what we started to notice in Q4 of 2020, definitely all of 2021, that organizations didn't want to do that due diligence, right? We wanted to start with like the quick fix, mm -hmm. the course, mm -hmm. the workshop. And just to give you a picture, if you're listening in, I'm like, okay, well, what does that look like? So we sat in a boardroom with 
Palo, who is the CEO of Bridgestone America. Mm-hmm. So the executive senior leader was in the room yep. with his leadership team. And literally we had a deck of maybe, I don't know, 20, 25 slides that in yep. the back of my mind, I knew <laughs> we're not getting through these slides. We maybe, maybe. We maybe made it through like five. Mm, I think that's ambitious. Maybe, maybe three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it, but but the conversation was so rich because yeah. we were able to settle in on okay, what do you as executive level leaders really believe that this means? And too mm-hmm. often, organizations don't take that step. Yep. With the executive leaders. Yep. Right. So that's so critical. So we we did that in that room, set the belief, built the strategy around that belief. Now, for many organizations, they'll bring in a partner, they'll do the strategic work, but then things start to get a little funny around implementation. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about (laughs) what the implementation has looked like with mid-level leaders really taking this forward in their everyday work. Hey Thriver, I'm excited for you to get your hands on your copy of the Blueprint to More Visibility and Influence. This is a powerful free resource that's designed to catapult your influence and amplify your impact in your business or company. Now, this isn't just another online guide. This is your strategic companion that's gonna walk you through the world of personal branding and authentic leadership. Inside, you'll unlock essential strategies that are gonna help you do a few things. One, sharpen your self-awareness and own your unique story, navigate the complexities of workplace dynamics with more confidence, elevate your presence in any room and ensure that you are not only seen, but also heard and valued. Why wait for opportunities when you can create them? With this blueprint, you'll learn how to cultivate a personal brand that commands respect and opens the door for new opportunities. And the best part, you'll start seeing the world differently, not just as a place where you fit in, but one where you stand out. You'll transform your self-doubt into more self-assurance and turn your aspirations into to tangible achievements. So join me in our community of thrivers who are making their mark. Don't let this moment pass you by. Head on over to letsthrivetogether.com to download your free copy of the blueprint to more visibility and influence today. Start your journey and let's thrive together. Yeah, so when we did that session, I was not in place. I was actually, this was a part of my role. We have a fantastic leader of talent uh, that led diversity and led talent. And it doesn't make sense for it to be together, but because the work requires so much, they needed a dedicated focus. And so uh, my position was created. I was given extra resources at a time when the business was cutting. And so that caused a bit of friction, right? You've got sales and numbers that you have to meet. And wait a minute, you're starting up something over here and they haven't even proven themselves. Um, and so the reason I start with that is because there was a bit of Uh, passion on one side and excitement and momentum from some groups, Mm -hmm. some managers. And then you had other managers that were like, I'm down a headcount. I'm down a resource. I got to go sell more tires or I got to do more with less. And this group is coming in here with more requests that I'm supposed to do. No way. Um, And so we approached it from a balanced perspective, right? We tried to simplify it. We tried to get everybody's ideas. We did implement some education, uh, but we we created these two resources that essentially sat alongside or sit alongside our HR partners um, and they work with the business to say, what is it that you need? You are saying that you have hiring challenges. How can DE&I be a benefit for you? You are not going to be able to fill roles if you just look for white Caucasian males or, and it's not just about race, right? It's also about generation. If you are looking for the seasoned experienced person that has 15 years of experience, not gonna find it because they've got jobs other, where, other, other places too. So how do you take talent and you groom them and you develop them? That's an element of diversity too, by the way. Yeah. So we sat alongside them essentially trying to help them understand the benefit, convince them why DNI matters. Um, and with our managers, we hold them accountable mm-hmm. to the numbers. So our CEO alongside of um, our exco member said, this is important. We want to see this reported out on. Yep. So our leaders report quarterly on our representation numbers on race and gender 
on hiring as well. Um, and then also completion rates for our trainings and things like that. And so that is how we got our managers to activate this because they knew they were held accountable to it and they had to report out. So they started asking for help and we've been trying to help them. Uh, we've got an organization of uh, 35,000. <laughs> Two people can't support everybody, mm -hmm. uh, but we certainly try to push best practices and use our HR partners and other partners to get the message out as well. Yeah, and and Bridgestone definitely is a leader in in that way because I remember sitting down, so like having conversation with your CHRO and talking very candidly about if this is what we said we believe and this is the strategy that we built together, then here are the people that are needed in order to implement yep. this and just having the opportunity to really be open and partnering with you all to say, okay, what does this look like for Bridgestone? Mm -hmm. I think that's also a miss sometimes too, that we try to pull a page from another organization because we see their name on someone's yep. list of best yep. places to work or what, whatever the, um, company might be, but that might not always fit your business structure. Yep. So you were mentioning your inclusion, um, Essentially, it's like an a inclusion business partner, yes. similar to an HR business partner. But like that person that's in the sitting in the business that's connected to your team was something that Bridgestone needed. And I think it really made a big difference. Yeah. Talk to us, unpack a little bit about the process of going from big vision to actual steps. Mm -hmm. Like break that down for us, because we talked about the vision setting in the room. Now you're holding leaders accountable and you have the support from your team to help push that forward. How do you get to that? Yeah, it's not easy, right? So I might have something in my head, but I can't always communicate that perfectly. I don't always have the time to do that. Um, so what I, I found I needed in order for me to properly execute the vision, I needed trust. I needed relationships. I needed legs and arms and hands and also minds, right, to poke holes. And that's that's what you want from inclusion. You want to have a great idea, but you want a team or a group of people to make it even better. You want to get to the solution that works for most, not all, because with diversity, there is no one size fits all, as you know. Um, but you want it you want it to land with the group. And so with my team, they were very integral and they still are, I might have a crazy idea. I'm like, y'all, I'm crazy. Hey, I'm thinking about this. And they're like, uh, maybe not that way. Try it this way. And I'm like, great, right? So we essentially got together, we took our framework and then we poked holes. Where does it make sense? Where does it not make sense? Then we pulled people from the business. We pulled our um, employee resource group leaders. I see one of them in the audience today. Um, and we said, does this make sense? What what are we missing? And we got feedback like this isn't strong enough. You your words on this paper are great, but you have these commitments, but it doesn't say anything about the leaders. So we changed our commitments to say our leaders will focus on this. Um, and so that was another example of testing it. Right. And then after that, we essentially said, OK, now we need to go build relationships with people so that they can see what I see so that they can trust me. Right. Some of them are blind because they don't know how others have their own opinions or ideas because it's rooted in their values. Yeah. So how do I help them see that their values aren't wrong? My values are not right, but we need to do this together. So we um, we essentially built relationships. We talked to our leaders. We. Uh, talk to them about why it matters. We gave them safe spaces to have conversations and ask questions and say, Ebony, what's the difference between Black and African American? I don't know. What's this pronoun thing, right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And we did that without judgment, which then built relationships. It built trust. And now I don't have to explain what free to be means. I've got a whole army of people that are out there talking about free to be and diversity, equity, and inclusion at Bridgestone. And it feels pretty great to set the vision and let it go. Yeah, so you, you mentioned Free To Be and that's one of your initiatives that there's branding around now, <laughs> there's a logo, there's a Free To Be Week. Yes. So talk to us a little bit about in alignment with that theme, how can leaders that are listening in really pull from what you all have been learning from tapping into your teammates to create an, an environment and a culture where people can show up and bring all of who they are and be free to be seen authentically. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you said it perfectly. See, a whole army of people evangelizing. Um, so free to be is the mantra of what it means to have DNI at Bridgestone. We didn't want to talk about diversity because diversity is a fact, but we used words to say, uh, you're free to be bold, which is one of our ERGs, right? Uh, you're free to be proud, which is another ERG. So we uh, incorporated and tried to, again, bring in what was working um, into this statement. And that statement also has a charge for the company that says, we will listen. We will celebrate your diversity, even if you don't know who or what you are just yet. Um, and so that's our commitment to our development as well. And so the reason I pull that out is because when you're talking about building or creating a culture of inclusion, you have to know what that means for you. Yeah. What you mentioned this too, it's not a plug and play model, right? You can't take what works for Bridgestone and say, I'm going to do an exact replica. It will not work. Mm -hmm. So for us, we did the hard work to say, what is it that makes us us? And what are we committed to doing about it? And we hold our leaders accountable to that. We uh, have an EVP now, an employee value proposition that is going to roll out. Um, and they took from the free to be mantra, right? They used words, they used our seal, they used uh, pictures and people of all different backgrounds because we started from a place of commitment and then we held our leaders accountable to that commitment mm -hmm. and our new teammates and our current teammates expect people uh, to come in and be themselves. And when they are not, they call them out. That's not free to be, or I thought we were free to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't tell you how many times I hear that. And I'm like, that's not exactly what we meant by that. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, go, go free to yeah. be, right? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what we do, right? Essentially, we, we created this mantra and we've got uh, momentum and energy. And I think when you have it from bottoms up, it's really hard for leaders to take it away. They have to incorporate it at that point. Um, and that's something that we we try to do. We try to be incorporated in our marketing, in our advertising, in our partnerships, in our branding with HR. Um, so we just keep inserting ourselves in every yeah. little piece of the org. And, and great partnerships as well. Yes. So talk to me about, you mentioned, um, we talked a little bit about free to be, and we went from this brainstorming meeting of digging into beliefs, you being promoted into VP, so leading the enterprise in this way. Someone might be listening and thinking, okay, like that sounds like a lot. How long did that take? Mm -hmm. Give us some context in terms of like the pacing of this. <sighs> so I'm sighing because it's never done. <laughs> <laughs> right, like up until this point. Uh huh. And I'm like, and it feels a lot longer. I've got gray hair to prove it. Um, but no, I came into role in technically we announced it in 2020. Mm -hmm. I was put in role January 1st, 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, the mantra was created around that same time, and I was part of that team and the architect behind it. Um, and I would say it takes a while, right? And it's sometimes it's two steps forward, one step backwards, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm put in place and I'm told I've got a team. Oh, but we have a hiring freeze. Mm -hmm. Crap. So now I'm supposed to do all of this work by myself and with my great partners. How does that work? Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say the momentum has been over the course of two years. But remember, this isn't new to Bridgestone. We had ERGs sure. in 2016. Um, we've kind of been doing diversity work since our inception. It, it, but it takes a while and it takes uh, patience. It takes moderation. And that's the other thing I think people think okay, I'm chief diversity officer or I'm VP of DNI. I can go make all these changes. Not quite. Nah, it doesn't work that way, right? Um, and you can have influence, but influence again comes from those relationships. And those relationships were relationships that I had started building since I started at Bridgestone yeah. in 2016. So, you know, short answer, it's 2023. Yeah, so about two seven years. years. Seven years total, total. from, from right, a relationship, right. of uh, but two-ish years to really get the momentum and, and start to see the movement. Yeah, so let, let's talk for a minute to the listener that's like, all right, y'all. Corporate leader, we know the talking points. Brittany, 
it's your client. So, you know, you're going to make them look good. And then in turn, they make you look good. Like, let's just, I just, I just want to talk to that listener because I know they're on and they're like, okay, uh-huh. mm-hmm. you giving us a song and dance. What would you say to the person that's like, Ebony, my company's been talking about DEI since 2014. Mm-hmm. And I'm still experiencing microaggressions. Yeah. I've been in this same role for the last five years, seeing people come in the door and get promoted in front of me. Mm. I'm still the only black woman on my team. And this company touts and even is being awarded mm. for DEI work. Yep. What would you say to encourage that listener? Um, That's a good question. I'd tell you, open your eyes, right? You can have a passion and you can have a desire to succeed in a place, but you don't have to stay anywhere that you're not thriving. Sometimes coming out of the place that you feel stuck is actually the blessing that you were hoping for or that you actually needed. Um, Every company is not the right company for you. And they've been talking about it. They said they want to do it. You're still experiencing microaggressions. Why? You're fabulous. You're brilliant. You were put on this earth to succeed and live in the purpose. So why stay somewhere? that doesn't have those same values. And that's what DE&I is about. It's about finding and connecting to the values. And if your company, it might be a fabulous company. They might pay you well. That's great. There's others that do that too. Come on to Bridgetown. Hey, and that's what's called owning your power, ladies and gentlemen. I love it. And I have to say, just a personal point of privilege, I just love the way you honor your voice. Like, this is not the ebony of 2020, okay? No. And I love it. This is also the ebony who is to date the Nashville Business Journal's 2023 Woman of Influence and the Nashville Business Journal's finalist for (laughs) DEI leader. So kudos to you. I'm so proud of how you have fully stepped into your own personal power as a leader, but also you are leading the charge and leading transformation inside Mm -hmm. of an organization that's like, wait, okay, this isn't the same Bridgestone. Mm -hmm. And people see that, they sense it, and certainly our community feels it as well. So as we wrap up, you said the word, what does thriving mean to you? So it means having joy. And why I say that is because happiness is a temporary state of mind, but joy, I'm a faith-based person, is something that you can hang on to when you're challenged, when you're operating in purpose, uh, when you're having fun, right? It's something that just gives you peace. And the journey is not easy. It is difficult at times, it's lonely at times, but when it's you operating in your purpose, you're thriving and you've got joy because why not count it all joy? It's great. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Ebony. Thank you for having me.